All right. It is good to see everybody here this morning. Uh, out as, as, a as fulfilling a request from several of you. Uh, I am going to start teaching the book of Revelation again. I actually have taught this book several times in my life as a gospel preacher. But there's a story I'd like to share with you. Uh, years ago, when I was finishing up Florida College, my primary teacher, Melvin Curry, was the last week, and he brought a bunch of the Bible students together, and he says, okay, you're about to go out into the world. You're about to become full-time gospel preachers. I want to make a request of you. Wherever you go, when you get there, don't start doing sermons on the Holy Spirit, and don't start teaching Revelation right off the bat. I, I remember that. And so... A couple of months later, I moved to Cleveland, Mississippi. I'm a full-time gospel preacher. It's the first week in Cleveland, and I tell the congregation, I'll preach on any subject you want. I'll teach any class you want. And this is actually what they said. We want sermons on the Holy Spirit, and we want you to teach Revelation. And so exactly what I was told not to do, that's what I did. And uh, to be honest with you, several years later on, after I had moved on from Cleveland, and I was back in Cleveland, I went back to them and apologized to them for the class on the book of Revelation because I taught it literally phrase by phrase, which is not the way to teach the book. And so having told you that right up front, I'm not going to go phrase by phrase. If you want to know phrase by phrase, talk to me after Bible class, and we can talk about that together and have some fun with it. But my primary desire is to help you understand what the book is about. Um, the problem with the book of Revelation is you're going to find that there are primarily three different approaches that are completely different to the book of Revelation. Um, I believe Romans is the primary text of the New Testament around which you have the bulk of false doctrine that has developed throughout the history of the church. But Revelation comes in second. Uh, the book of Revelation, because it is written in apocalyptic writing, which is a lot of figurative language and a lot of symbolism, uh, because it has a lot of figurative languages and a lot of symbolism, then people can take the figurative language and symbolism in different directions. But also, you need to understand that there are three basic fundamental approaches to the text which are different. The question is, when, is, when are the prophecies that are in this text going to be taking place. Uh, you will find that one of the predominant approaches to the text that's very popular in America is called premillennialism. In premillennialism, it's the idea that the, the events being described in the book of Revelation are going to take place toward the close of the history of mankind. Uh, and, and one of their main characters in the 13th chapter, they would call him the Antichrist, although that term is nowhere in the chapter. And then they believe that there is going to be a time when Satan is going to be loosed. There's going to be these seven years uh, that are going to be intense persecution. Armageddon, and after Armageddon, Jesus is going to come again and set up a thousand-year reign on earth. That's premillennialism. Another approach to the book is called the historical interpretation. Uh, the historical interpretation basically takes the events prophesied in the book of Revelation. When I'm talking about prophesied, I'm talking about what is called the seven seals, the seven trumpets, and the seven bowls of wrath, and then the close of Revelation. And they say this is applying to the apostasy of the Catholic Church, of the Roman Catholic persecution, such as the Inquisition, and then the rise of the Reformation and Restoration Movement in, in, in Europe. Uh, you will find commentaries written by people that are caught up in the time period of the Reformation movement uh, would approach it this way sometimes. Uh, even brethren today sometimes still take that approach. I believe both those approaches are completely wrong. I do not believe the book of Revelation is talking about premillennialism, nor do I believe it's talking about the persecution of the Catholic Church upon European people. Um, the very beginning here in the class, what I'm going to try to do is give you what I call the setting of the book of Revelation. The book itself tells you how it's meant to be interpreted. And I just want to show you this. So we're going to start very first chapter, very first verse, 
it tells you how it's supposed to be interpreted. Reading from the outline that I've given you, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants, things which must shortly take place, and he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant, John. Notice what I have for you on the overhead here. The phrase, things which must shortly take place. To me, that is crucial to understanding the book because what he is about to write about is dealing with things that must shortly take place. It means exactly what it says. Then when you drop down to verse 3 of chapter 1, Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. And so chapter 1, verse 1, things that must surely take place. Chapter 1, verse 3, for the time is near. The book tells you how it's meant to be interpreted. Now, this does not fit, fit premillennialism. Uh, premillennialism will say, well, it's, it's happening right now. By the way, premillennialists, if you go back and you study them for centuries, they always say it's happening right now. <laughs> and they always have their Antichrist for their particular age. But the problem with it is, even if it's happening soon, 2,024 years is not shortly taking place. 2,024 years is not the time is near. That doesn't fit. Nor does it fit the historical interpretation with the idea of it being the 1300s or through the 1300s to the 1600s in Europe. No, 13 to 1600 is not shortly taking place. 1600 is not a time that is near. And so both of those approaches to the book do not fit what the book says about itself at the very beginning. The third approach which we're going to take, which I believe, is that it is dealing with things that are going to shortly take place. It is dealing with a time that is near, and that it is dealing with the persecution of the church by the Roman Empire. That's what I believe the book is primarily about. Now, having said that, let's go to the close of the book of Revelation, this time, chapter 22 and verse 6. Then he said to me, these words are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show his servants the things which must shortly take place. All I'm wanting you to see here is at the end of the book, he reiterates exactly what he said in the very first verse of the book. It is things which must shortly take place. The exact same phrase. And then when you go to chapter 22 and verse 10, he says, and he said to me, do not seal the words of the prophecy of this book for the time is at hand. The time is at hand, the time is near, saying the same thing two different ways. All I'm trying to show you is the book tells you how it's supposed to be interpreted, how it's supposed to be approached. It is dealing with the time that is near, time that is at hand. It is dealing with things that must shortly take place. And the persecution of the church by the Roman Empire fits perfectly. Um, if you were to study commentaries that are the premillennial approach, the beast in chapter 13, they always apply to some political factor in their particular history. If you were to go back and read commentaries that are premillennial uh, in the time of, let's say, the 1940s, uh, you will find those commentaries make Hitler the Antichrist. Uh, if you go back to the time of Nixon, I remember during the time of Nixon, the commentary said that Henry Kissinger was the Antichrist. You probably don't know who that is. Some of you, he was the Secretary of State. But then uh, I remember back during the time of Reagan, you remember Gorbachev over in Russia and his birthmark on his head? They said the birthmark on his head was the mark of the beast. It's just a birthmark, guys. But they said it was the mark of the beast, and so Gorbachev was the Antichrist during the time of Reagan. Um, right now, if you don't know this, a lot of them are saying that Barack Obama is the Antichrist. And I jokingly said in the uh, Wednesday night Bible class, they might be right this time. And that is a joke. I'm just joking. <laughs> but, but, but the point I'm trying to make is every generation finds some character in their present time period that is important politically, and then ascribe him to being the beast of chapter 13. Now, if you were to study the historical approaches to the book of Revelation, they're going to make the beast of chapter 13 to be one of the popes. 
It's always one of the popes, and it's usually one of the popes that is alive or has been alive during the lifetime or close to the lifetime of the one who wrote the commentary. I don't believe any modern day individual is the beast, chapter 13. I don't believe any pope is the beast of chapter 13 of Revelation. Uh, as a matter of fact, one of the things I'm going to try to show you is that Daniel 7, Daniel 7 tells you who the beast is. If you understand that Daniel 7 and Revelation 13 are talking about the same individual, Daniel 7 gives you the interpretation of the symbolic language, and it takes you to the fourth kingdom and the eleventh king of the fourth kingdom. And the fourth kingdom is the Roman Empire. The eleventh king is the one that began the great persecution against the church. His name was Domitian. And so that is what I believe the book is primarily about. It is primarily dealing with things that must shortly take place, not 2,024 years in the future, not 1,600 years in the future, but right in their time period, in their lifetime. As a matter of fact, look at Revelation chapter 1 and verse 9. And by the way, all I'm doing here in this setting, I'm starting at the first chapter and going to the end of the book in chronological order, okay? These verses are, you just notice chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 6, chapter 12, chapter 13. I'm just taking this in chronological order to try to give you what I call big picture. And by the way, that's the way we're going to study the book of Revelation. I'm going to show you big pictures. Sometimes we will slow down and look at a text more closely, such as the letters to the seven churches. We will slow down and look at those a little more slowly. But when we get to the fourth chapter, we're going to kick it into high gear, and we're going to start looking at big pictures. I want you to understand what the message of the book is about. And so here in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 9, it says, I, John, both your brother and companion in the tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was on the island that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. All right, notice the first thing I've underlined for you here. John the apostle is already a companion in the tribulation. The tribulation is already present, active, happening. It's already happening. And John is a companion in the tribulation. He is on the island that is called Patmos. Now then, let me show you where Patmos is. All right, see right there, that little island? That's Patmos. Notice it is right off the shore from Ephesus. Patmos was a Roman prison island. Think of Alcatraz, but bigger and more further out from the shore. Uh, all they had to do was take them to Patmos and leave them there, and you can't get off because you're surrounded by the Aegean Sea, and if you try to leave, you're going to drown. And so he is on this prison island. There's a Roman prison island, and the reason he's on the island, I want you to see. Let's go back to that text. Oh, wrong way. There it is. He was on the island that is called Patmos. Two things, for the word of God, and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now y'all make a mental marker on that phrase, for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. He's preaching the word of God and he's giving testimony to the fact that Jesus is the Christ, that he has done these miracles, that he was crucified and rose from the dead. And so when you're talking about the testimony of Jesus Christ, it has to do with who he is. He's bearing witness and testimony to the fact that Jesus is the Christ. Because he was preaching Christ crucified and that he is the Christ, and because he was preaching the word of God, he was taken and put in prison on the island that is called Patmos. And so he is a companion in the tribulation. It is presently actively happening. And so that's pretty near, isn't it? He's already in prison because of preaching the word of God. Uh, Also on this particular map here, you're going to see that the letter is written to the seven churches in Asia. Uh, this is Asia Minor. We call this Turkey today. Uh, this is called Asia. This is, this is a province of the Roman Empire named Asia. And you'll notice here is Ephesus. Here's Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. These are the seven churches to whom John is told to write this revelation down and send it to them. Um, interesting little thing here, this is a town, that is, these towns are connected by a, what we would call a road. There, it was easy for them to get the information from Patmos to Ephesus, and once it's here, uh, one of the things the Romans did is they made really good roads. In the ancient time, it was really big to have a road. 
Uh, and so this was, we would call it a post route almost to where you take the information in Ephesus and then it gets out very quickly to these other places and then disseminates out from there. And so that's where the seven churches are located uh, here in the province of Asia. All right, chapter 2, verse 10. If I were going to pick one verse, just one verse, that tells you what the theme of the book is and what it's all about, this is that verse. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison. Let's stop right there. Just notice the phrase, you are about to suffer. Okay, the people to whom he is writing are about to to suffer. This is near, soon, shortly going to take place. This is describing to you again what the book is all about as far as time, that it is dealing with the individuals who are receiving the letter. This is what's going to be happening to them. They're going to suffer. And he tells them how. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison. Let's stop right there. How is a spiritual being going to come and drag you out of your house and drag you into prison? He's not. <laughs> he's a spiritual being. Okay, the point I'm trying to make is he's going to be working through the government. But the one who is behind the persecution being driven by the government, the one who's behind the persecution, behind it all, is the devil. You've got to understand that what we're seeing here in the book of Revelation is spiritual warfare, if you will, and its manifestations in the physical world. Now follow what I just said. What we're seeing here in the book of Revelation is spiritual warfare between God and Satan and its manifestations in the physical realm. And so the one who is behind them suffering, the one who is behind them being thrown into prison, is the devil. So what you have in the book of Revelation is a battle between God and Satan and its physical manifestations. <clears throat> okay. The devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested, and you will have tribulation 10 days. Okay, let's stop right there. One of the lessons I'm going to probably give you next Sunday morning, Lord willing, is Hebrew symbolism in numbers. Uh, there are numbers that you're going to be seeing a lot of in the book of Revelation, and also you already find them throughout the Bible. And over time, these numbers became symbolic to the Hebrews. Uh, one of their numbers that was symbolic to them was the number 10. For instance, you're very familiar with the Ten Commandments, the Ten Plagues during the time of Egypt and Moses. Uh, one thing I know you're all familiar with, I got ten fingers. By the way, I've also got ten toes. And so from that little concept right there comes the concept that ten comes to represent complete and full. And so you're going to be seeing ten and multiplications of 10 used in the book of Revelation. And so when he says you're going to have tribulation 10 days, I believe the idea is you're going to be persecuted and they're going to persecute you to the fullest. They're going to torture you. And according to Fox's book of martyrs, that's exactly what they did to the Christians. Um, if you ever read Fox's book of martyrs, be prepared to have nightmares but uh, in it, it describes the trial of Christians. One of the things I'm going to be giving you later on is a letter uh, from Pliny to Emperor Trajan uh, that archaeologists have uncovered. And in the letter from Pliny to Emperor Trajan, he is writing the letter questioning how he should proceed with the trial of Christians. And the way in which the trial basically took place is they would set a bust statue of the emperor in front of the individual who's being tried and tell them to worship the image. Uh, they had to worship the image and sometimes also renounce Christ. If they would worship the image and renounce Christ, they would be given a piece of paper and they would be able to go buy and sell uh, and they would be free from persecution because they had proved that they worshiped the idol. Those who refused to worship the emperor's bust, after three attempts, they were persecuted and killed. Uh, the only thing that you had to be found guilty of in order to be put to death was being a Christian. And the way they would try a Christian is a Christian would not renounce Christ, and a Christian would not worship the image of the beast, or I should say the emperor. 
and because they would not worship the emperor's bust, they were put to death. That's Pliny's letter to Trajan describing it. And so what we're talking about here is the persecution of Christianity, the torturing of Christians, and they're going to be tortured to the fullest. And he says, be faithful to the death, and I will give you the crown of life. This is something you must understand. The Christians were expected to be willing to die for their faith. The question that's going to arise in the minds of Christians when all of a sudden the church is being persecuted and Christians are being killed in mass, is wait a minute, is God God? Is Jesus really the king of this world? Is he really the Christ? Is he really at the right hand of God? How can God be God and Jesus be the king of this world and the Christ of this world and he being allowing these things to happen? See how that works? You start questioning who's in control here. Am I really a citizen of the kingdom of God? If I'm a citizen of the kingdom of God, why is God allowing this to happen to me? What's God going to do about it? And so first of all, you need to recognize God was allowing it to happen. Jesus the Christ was allowing it to happen. And those individuals that were going to go through this, they were expected to be faithful to death, to be willing to give their life go all the way through the torture and the persecution and be willing to die for their faith. And when they would do that, then they would be given the crown of life. Again, if I were going to pick one verse, just one, to help you understand what the entire book is about, this is the verse. If you just read this verse, you can understand what the entire book is about. Okay, chapter 6 now. Verses 9 through 11. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. Let's stop right there. Do you remember why John the Apostle was put in prison on the island of Patmos? Go back and read it. It's right there in front of you. He says, on the island that is called Patmos, for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. So these individuals here in Revelation chapter 6 they have been slain. They've already been put to death for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. The same two things. You see that? The word of God and the testimony. The testimony has to do with Jesus is Christ. Jesus is the King of Kings. Jesus is the Lord. And so if they were going to hold to that testimony about Jesus, if they were going to hold to the word of God and not let go of it, then they were going to die. All right, what you have here in Revelation 6, 9 through 11 are individuals who have already died. Their souls, and their souls are crying out to God. And I want you to see in verse 10 what their souls are saying. And they cried out with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Okay, the question in verse 10, chapter 6. The rest of the book is about it. <laughs> okay, the rest of the book that comes after this is answering that question. And the point is, God is going to allow more Christians to die. Verse 11, Then a white robe was given to each of them, and it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who would be killed as they were was completed. To a certain level, that's kind of discouraging, isn't it? When you're told, how long, O Lord, holy and true, until you avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? So the individuals who've already died here, they're wanting God to punish those on earth who tortured them, who caused them tribulation, and killed them. God's answer is there's going to be more Christians that are going to die. And he says they would be killed as they were, was completed. And so there's going to be more that's going to be killed. Now, as I told you earlier, I believe uh, the book of Revelation, the 13th chapter, just cutting to the chase, I believe it's talking about Domitian. If you don't know who he was, he was a Roman emperor who declared himself to be Lord God Domitian. And uh, he set up temples across the Roman Empire to himself. He expected the Roman citizens to worship him as Lord God Domitian. The Christian's refusal to do so is the reason it was outlawed by the Roman Empire. 
It was the reason if you were found to be a Christian, you could be put to death because they refused to worship the emperor. That's the beginning of the empire-wide persecution of the church. You will find that Nero actually began the persecution of Christianity before Domitian. Uh, Nero persecuted Christians primarily in and around Rome, the city. Do you remember the burning of Rome? Okay, and how Nero fiddled while Rome burnt. Well, while, I should say, after it was burnt, who did Nero blame the fire on? Christians. And so in Rome itself began a great persecution against the Christians in Rome. Uh, a, a Roman historian talks about how Nero used Christians to light up his gardens at night. In other words, they would be dipped in pitch, put on a post, set on fire, and their bodies would be burning all night long in his gardens. So the persecution against Christians by the Roman Empire initially begins with Nero, but it is more localized in Rome itself where the Domitian persecution goes empire-wide. And now here comes the sad news. Remember the text says here, until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who would be killed as they were was completed, the persecution continued on for about 200 years. Yeah. Just because Domitian dies, the persecution doesn't end. It begins with Domitian, and it goes all the way through, I believe, taking out of my head, the guy's name was Diocletian. And Diocletian, again, in the latter 200s, persecuting the church still. Matter of fact, the persecution of Christianity did not end until Emperor Constantine basically legalized Christianity. And so the point I'm trying to make here is, you think about 200 years. How long have we been around as the United States of America? A little over 200 years. You know, 1776, 1976, that's 200 years. So during that time period, Christians are dying for their faith. What you see here is Satan basically trying to wipe out the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Christ on earth by killing them. But there's something going on here. I believe it was Tertullian who said that the blood of the Christians was the seed of the gospel. And that is... The more Christians died for their faith, the faster it spread across the Roman Empire. As a matter of fact, reading from Fox's Book of Martyrs, it talked about how, how the executioners were one of the individuals that obeyed the gospel more than anybody. And the reason for all of this is because the Roman citizens are watching these people. They hadn't done anything wrong. They're good citizens. They show kindness and love to everybody around them. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with these people. And yet when they are tortured... They don't renounce Christ. When they're brought into the arena, they're singing and they're praying together. And as a Roman citizen saw this and was watching this, they wanted, now what do these people got? How can they have peace when they're dying? How can they be singing and praying when they're dying? And what they found in their search was Christ crucified. And so the more the Roman Empire tried to stamp it out by killing them, the more it spread. God allowed Christians to die for their faith. These are the men and women that I look to with great admiration because in the beginning of the kingdom of God on earth, these individuals held to their faith. When I went to Rome, it's kind of like a spiritual pilgrimage. Because I know a lot of history, I did a lot of crying. I cried whenever I touched the Colosseum. I cried when I saw the Ark of Constantine. I cried when I touched the Ark of Titus. I cried when I was at the Circus Maximus. Because I know it happened there. I know the countless thousands of Christians that died at those locations. I know what those statues are all about. And so having a historical understanding of where those statues come from, Every time I got close to one, I couldn't help but start weeping. That's what this book is about. It's about this time period. It's about these individuals who are going to die for their faith. As we continue here now, 
chapter 12. Again, if I were going to, trying to pick out which chapter is the biggest chapter of all is almost impossible. But chapter 12 is a very important chapter. I just put it that way. <laughs> okay. Chapter 12 is where you have the war in heaven. Okay. Uh, Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. Uh, he destroyed the works of Satan in Christ crucified. He dealt with sin. And in the resurrection, he dealt with death. But Satan was a spiritual being still allowed to go into heaven, to go into the presence of God with his angels even. After Christ's death, burial, and resurrection and ascension, you have Revelation 12. And just through the power of the blood of the Christ, that he's basically driven out of heaven completely. And now he's cast down to earth. And the text talks about how he was enraged. Verse 17 of chapter 12 is a crucial verse to understand the book of Revelation. He, that he is talking about is Satan. He went to make war with the rest of her offspring. That's what the book's about. We're the offspring. The church is the offspring. This is talking about Satan making war against the church. Again, remember chapter 2 and verse 10? The devil's about to cast some of you into prison. We're talking about spiritual enemy number one. And his intention is to make war against the church and to wipe it out by killing them all. He went to make war with the rest of our offspring. Notice these two things. Who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. There that is again. There's the third time. I showed you the first time. You remember chapter 1, verse 9, John. And then chapter 6. Okay, here it is in chapter 12 again. Who's he making war against? Those who keep the commandments of God. Why? Wow. That's you. That's me. And those who have the testimony of Jesus Christ, that's you. That's me. Chapter 13. Chapter 13, the first part of the chapter is talking about the sea beast. The latter part of the chapter is talking about the land beast. Chapter 13 is telling us how a spiritual being is going to make war against a physical church. Just follow that sentence. Chapter 13 is telling you how a spiritual being, Satan, is going to make war against a physical church. Chapter 13, verse 7, it was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. All I'm wanting you to see here is in chapter 12, it talks about Satan making war against the rest of her offspring. Her offspring are the saints. They are those who keep the commandments of God. They are those who hold to the testimony of Jesus Christ. They're all the same individuals. So Satan is making war, but he's granted to this individual who is a physical being to make war with the church. And notice this last part, and to overcome them. The church is going to be allowed to have war made against it to the point to where many of them, many of them for a long time are going to die. And then when you go down finally to chapter 13, verse 15, as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed, I'm going to read the whole point here, chapter 13, verse 15, he was granted power to give birth to the image of the beast the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. Okay, I've already told you who I believe the beast is. I believe the beast is referring in the context here to Domitian. Uh, when you go to Daniel chapter 7, Daniel 7 lays out precisely what the symbolism and the figurative language is talking about. It is talking about the fourth kingdom and it's talking about ten kings in the fourth kingdom and then the 11th king in the fourth kingdom is going to be the one who's going to be making war against the saints. He's going to be the one who's going to be allowed to overcome them. And the particular way in which this war is going to be carried out has to do with what's called the land beast here in chapter 13. And he is going to be a false prophet. So we're talking about a religion built around the sea beast. The religion built around the sea beast is talking about Domitian setting up his temples across the Roman Empire, expecting all the Roman citizens to worship him and declare him to be Lord God Domitian. If you were going to speak to him in person, you had to declare him Lord God Domitian. If you wrote to him, you had to write to him Lord God Domitian. 
He expected to be worshipped as God by all the Roman Empire. The Christians' refusal to do it is why they were killed. As a matter of fact, as I told you in Pliner's letter to Trajan, that's exactly precisely how they were killed. I remember when we were in Rome, my daughter Jennifer was with us, and there was a statue of Domitian. And she went up and stood in front of it and said, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, Son of God. And my wife and I, we figured out kind of quickly what was going on here. And so we followed suit. But I'll be quite honest with you. I wasn't afraid. Nothing was going to happen to me if I didn't say, say Lord God, Domitian. Nothing was going to happen to me if I confessed Christ. These people, they had their children and their wives tortured, and then they were tortured, and then they were put to death because they refused to worship the image of the emperor, because they refused to renounce Christ. They held to the word of God. They held to the testimony of Jesus Christ. That Jesus is the Christ. And for their refusal, they were killed. That's what the book is about. <laughs> it is not about premillennialism. It is not about the Roman Inquisition. It is about a time that is going to shortly take place. The time is near. The time is at hand. This is talking about what they were about to go through. You are about to be thrown into prison. And it's going to happen soon. John was already in prison on the island of Patmos. All right. Revelation 17, verse 6. I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I marveled with great amazement. One of the uh, main characters you're going to be seeing in the book of Revelation is referred to as Babylon the harlot. And uh, there are obviously in different commentaries, questions about exactly who is Babylon the harlot. Well, again, the good thing for us is in the book of Revelation, God gives four identifying traits to help you identify Babylon the harlot. Number one, it's a city. Number two, it's a city that reigns over the kings of the earth. Number three, it's a city that sets on seven mountains. Number four, it is responsible for the blood of the saints. It's a city that's responsible for the persecution of Christianity. Uh, a city on seven mountains. If you don't know this, Rome to this very day is called the city of seven hills because it is literally situated on seven hills. Uh, it is the city that rules over all the kings of the earth. Jerusalem never reigned over the kings of the earth. Rome did. Jerusalem could not send out a Roman Empire persecution. They did not have that power. Rome did. And not only did Rome have the power to do it, Rome did it. And so the point I'm trying to make, as I believe the woman who's called Babylon the harlot, is talking about the capital of the Roman Empire, Rome itself. And so Rome and the Roman Empire is drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. That's what the book's about. All I'm doing is going through the book chronologically, trying to show you that what the book says is about and then what it tells you about again, and what it tells you about again, it just continues all the way through the book. Because you've got to see the big picture to understand what the particular parts are. I know some of you do puzzles, because I've seen them in your house. Those of you who ever do puzzles, there's something that you've all done. You've picked up the box and looked at the big picture. The reason you usually do that is because you find a piece, you can't figure where it goes. And so you start looking at the big picture and you go, oh, I see this fits over here. What I'm trying to do is show you the big picture of the book of Revelation. Because if you understand what the big picture is, then you can understand where the particular parts fit in. But you've got to understand what the big picture is to understand the particulars. Since that was the buzzer, let's go ahead and finish this up. <clears throat> Revelation 18 and verse 24. And in her was found the blood of prophets and saints, and all who were slain on the earth. And so again, this is talking about Babylon the harlot. 
It was filled with the blood of prophets and saints martyred and the martyrs of Jesus Christ. Uh, one last verse. Revelation 20 and verse 4. And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who have been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God. There it is again. You remember that phrase? The word of God, the testimony of Jesus Christ. So when you get to the very end of Revelation 20, you find the first time chapter 1. Okay, here again you find in chapter 20, but you're talking about people who have been beheaded. They've already died. We're talking about the same soul, by the way, that are back in chapter 6. When you get to chapter 20, they're on thrones. They're reigning with Christ. And the reason they were beheaded was for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God. Getting back, it says, on the outline, uh, who had not worshipped the beast or his image and not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Okay, let's go back to that one more time. This, by the way, is the verse that premillennialism gets their whole concept from. These are the same souls that were under the altar. By the way, in the seventh chapter, you're going to see them in the temple before God, before the throne of God. And so, finally, they're reigning with Christ. God eventually is going to persecute Rome. And the Roman Empire is going to collapse. That's what the majority of the book is about. How God is going to persecute those individuals and is going to bring up persecute, is going to avenge, that's the better way to put it, avenge the blood of those who are being put to death. Now then, I've got a little bit of time here, and so I'm going to go off on a brief tangent. There is a technique God uses in the book of Revelation that I've talked about numerous times to you, and that is what I call echo techniques. The book of Revelation is filled with echoes. That is God saying the same thing, not two times, but three times. I'll give an example. I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Did you see that? I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. That's Jesus describing himself in the close of the book of Revelation. He's saying the same thing three different ways, three times. I cannot or emphasize that is a technique God uses throughout the Bible. He uses it a whole lot here in the book of Revelation. So the point I'm trying to make is this. The seven seals, the seven trumpets, and the seven bowls of wrath are saying the same thing three different ways. They're not different things. It's the same thing different ways. And whether you realize it or not, I just covered the bulk of the book of Revelation and its symbolic language. By simply showing you the seven seals, the seven trumpets, and the seven bowls of wrath are not different things. It's saying the exact same thing three different ways. Okay, so the big picture of the book of Revelation, warfare, Satan behind it all, physical manifestation, Christians are going to be persecuted and die for their faith. They're expected to be faithful to death and God will give them the crown of life. They're wondering how long, O oh Lord, holy and true, before you avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth. The answer is given, more are going to die. God's going to allow Christians to die for their faith. But eventually, God was going to punish Babylon the harlot, Rome, and the Roman Empire, and it was going to collapse. That's what the seven seals, the seven trumpets, and the seven bowls of wrath are all about. God's ultimate vengeance on Babylon the harlot for the persecution of Christians. Okay, we'll stop right there.